Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Getting Started with Spring Security 3.2. My name is Rob Winch, and I'm the Spring Security Project Lead. All right, uh, a little bit about myself before we get started. Uh, my name is Rob Winch, as I mentioned before. I'm the Spring Security Project Lead, and I'm also the Spring LDAP Project Lead. I'm a committer on the core Spring Framework, and I also am co-author of the Spring Security 3.1 book. Um, that's enough about myself. Don't want to bore you too much. What is Spring Security? Spring Security's primary focus is about authentication and authorization. And um, actually, I, I, I probably should have added in there real quick. Um, we'll talk about what Spring Security is very briefly. And then we'll talk about what's new in Spring Security 3.2. And then we're going to demo uh, a live application that will basically be kind of targeted at two different audiences, audiences that are familiar with Spring Security 3.1 and prior. And, uh, and they want to learn about Spring Security 3.2, but it'll also target people that are new to Spring Security entirely and want to get up and running. So it, that's the primary focus of this presentation. Hopefully not too many people leave at that point. All right, so what is Spring Security? Spring Security's primary focus is about authentication and authorization. Authentication identifies the who. Who's trying to access a particular resource? And in security, we identify this in a number of different ways, but one of the most common ways we do this is using a username and password. And you might want to store that username and password in a number of different types of data stores. For example, if you want to get up and running quickly, you might want to use in-memory authentication. You might also want to use JDBC or LDAP-based authentication if you're doing something more realistic. Spring Security provides mechanisms for these out of the box. Uh, but you might not even want to do a username-based uh, authentication. You might want to do single sign-on, like CAS, or you might want to do SAML or OpenID. You might even want to use OAuth for authentication, which is kind of blurry on if that's what you should be doing. But you know, some people use OAuth for authentication, not just authorization. You can do that if you want. All of these are provided, again, out of the box. But where Spring Security's main, uh, probably its best thing is if you don't see something implemented already, you can easily extend it to meet your custom requirements. We'll go over some of the evolution of how you might evolve your application from in-memory to custom authentication later on in the presentation. Once you've identified who is making a particular request, you need to decide, are they allowed to access it? And that's where authorization comes into play. Authorization in a web application is typically done based upon the HTTP servlet request. So you might say, if the URL starts with slash admin, I want an admin user only to be able to access that URL. And you could do things much more complicated, like um, you, could, you could say, based upon the HTTP method, I only want HTTP post, delete, and put uh, to be an authenticated user. Uh, because any read-only data, I can allow anyone to access. So all these things are very possible with Spring Security. Furthermore, you can do a layering on top of that with method-level security. Method-level security can be implemented just by adding an annotation with uh, your service tier. And you can state, given a particular user, are they allowed to invoke a particular method? And that annotation uh, can also contain a spring expression in it. And that spring expression can make your access control decision based upon your return value or your arguments passed in. And don't worry if that was kind of uh, hard to understand if you're new. We're going to go over that in more detail later. So that's just kind of a preview of what's to come. Spring Security also provides protection against a number of common attacks. One of those types of attacks is called session fixation. It's been around for a while, but basically the idea is that an attacker will send a session ID to a user so that they establish a session that someone already knows. And then when they authenticate, the attacker can use that session ID to impersonate the user. A common way to prevent this type of attack is to change the session ID as soon as the user authenticates. This is one of the things Spring Security does out of the box to protect you. So even if you aren't aware of these types of attacks, Spring Security will be protecting you. Now, there's other types of attacks that it'll pr help protect against. We're actually going to demonstrate some of those attacks in a live application, and then we'll show Spring Security enabled and how it's protecting you against these other types of attacks. Spring Security also integrates with the servlet APIs. So if you want standards, you can still use the standards. For example, you can access the, the current user from the HTTP servlet request you can determine if the user is in a particular role from the current request. All of this is very easy to do with Spring Security. There's also optional integration with Spring MVC. That's new in Spring Security 3.2. 
We'll talk about that a little bit more detail later on, but just know that it's there. And finally, last but not least, portability. You might say, well, container managed security is portable because it's a standard. So if I go from one container to another, it's just going to work, right? Well, in actuality, that isn't always or really the case. The issue becomes is standards don't define everything that is necessary for an application. They're kind of very high level and leave out a lot of the details. For example, if you're trying to configure container managed security, it's going to vary from vendor to vendor. And not only that, that configuration is for the container. So as soon as you move to a different container, so you have 10 developers working on a project, you have to have that configuration set up 10 different times. And then you might have a dev and a prod and a non-prod instance. And you'd have to copy it over all those times. Spring Security embeds within your war. And the configuration and all that is set up once. You might have some environmental specific properties, but that's very minimal compared to what else you might have to configure. Furthermore, because the jars and all your dependencies are embedded in the war, you can avoid a lot of class loading issues that you might have with a container managed security that's in probably a shared class loader or a parent class loader. It, it might pollute your class path, and you might have to be restarting your uh, Tomcat or Jetty or whatever uh, web application server instance to avoid things like permgen leaks. So that's one of the nice things about Spring Security's portability is it's, it's all within the war. All right, so we've gone over briefly what Spring Security is, but now we're going to talk a little bit about what's new in Spring Security 3.2. There's added support for Servlet 3 and 3.1 integration. So Servlet 3 adds a number of new methods to the HTTP Servlet request and response. Spring Security integrates with these now out of the box. For example, HTTP Servlet request now has a login method that allows you to pass in the username and password, and that'll send it to Spring Security's authentication manager and attempt to authenticate the user. If they're authenticated, the user will be established and you'll be good to go, otherwise an exception is thrown. There's a logout method, pretty self-explanatory. There's also an authenticate method that uh, determines if the current user is authenticated, if not, sends them to a login page. There's other methods in Servlet 3. You can check out the specification and kind of the Spring Security doc. We won't go over all of them. Uh, but there's also integration with Servlet 3.1. 3.1 added a method for changing the session ID. So going back to our previous example of session fixation, Previously, Spring Security, in order to protect you against that sort of attack, would have to invalidate the session, create a new session, and then it would have to copy all the session attributes over to the new session. That could be quite costly if you're using session replication in a clustered environment. Session, change session ID uh, allows us to easily implement that in Servlet 3.1, and it's the default used if you're in a 3.1 environment and haven't explicitly configured how you want that uh, session fixation protection to be implemented. We also added concurrency support. So concurrency support is essentially an easy way to transfer your current user's identity from one thread to another. And that actually is the foundation for some of the Servlet 3 support that we were mentioning previously. So Servlet 3 also introduced asynchronous requests. And the asynchronous requests uh, require us to transfer the session ID from one thread to another. So that's built on top of the concurrency support. Spring MVC integration is another example. Spring MVC integration also has async support, and it's also built on top of the concurrency support that Spring Security provides. And if neither of those meet your needs, you can, of course, build on top of that concurrency support yourself. So you have, you have some options there where it's integrated automatically, and you can also customize it by building on top of it yourself. There's also cross-site request forgery protection. Who knows what that is? Anyone? All right, so a good number. Cross-site request forgery protection, an example is you log into a website, and then you visit a malicious website. And that malicious website might re um, make requests on your behalf. So for example, it might delete your messages from that evil website because you forgot to log out. Another example might be it might grant itself access to see your email. Uh, all these things would happen without you necessarily even knowing. So we'll talk about cross-site request forgery in more detail later and how Spring Security protects you against it. There's also security header integration. And um, that basically what that is is you have certain HTTP servlet response headers, or I guess HTTP response headers, that are very security related. And Spring Security has added support for a lot of these. So for example, cache control. Cache control is very important in security. And uh, say you log in, you log out, you leave the computer, someone else walks up, they browse the history. Well, that's something you 
very easy for you to implement yourself, but it could be easily overlooked. Spring Security is now, by default, anything that it's intercepting will set the cache control to basically not allow caching. Now, that's not to say that you can't cache things. It's very easy to override that. In fact, if you explicitly set your cache headers for things like static images, CSS, JavaScript, it'll cache it no problem, like Spring Security wasn't even there. The point is, is that we're trying to be secure by default. And of course, you can disable, disable that if you want as well. It's all, it's all easy to change. There's also other headers that we'll get into that protect you from other types of attacks. Um, for example, clickjacking attacks. Um, and we'll demonstrate that later on in the presentation as well. And last but not least, Spring Security provides Java configuration support. Spring Security used to be configured using standard XML beans, and then we introduced the XML namespace, and that made it a ton easier. Then Java configuration support came around, and everyone said, well, how do I do it with Java configuration support? And the answer used to be very difficultly. Now, we have first-class uh, first support with Java configuration, so we'll be demoing that uh, throughout the rest of the application, too. All right, I hope you guys aren't too disappointed, but that's about all the slides I have. The rest of the time, we're going to be doing some live coding. We'll start off by demonstrating our application here. And our application is uh, pretty basic. It uh, allows us to view some messages. We can click on these links and see the details of the messages. We're also able to click on Compose, and we can send a new message to our users. This, this one actually doesn't exist, so we'll do Luke. And you can see that I was able to create a new message, and then um, I can actually go in here and delete the new message. And we also have this tab here called Database, and this isn't something that we implemented ourselves. It's actually, um, it's actually implemented by H2 Database, but we're able to connect and uh, this, is, this is nice because then we can go ahead and select our tables here. And uh, one of the things I want to point out is that we already have an existing user model. And this is used in our application inherently because we need to be able to send messages to the user. And, um, and so we already have this model. We could use the email for the username. And then we have a password field. And we won't have time to address this, but I want you to realize that passwords should be hashed. And Spring Security can easily hash them for you using the password encoder interface, but we won't have time to address that. So just know that if you are implementing this yourselves, that you need to make sure that you hash your passwords and that Spring Security can support that for you, no problem. All right, I'll get off the soapbox about securing your passwords. And um, the first thing that we notice about this app is that we are um, not even authenticating. So how can we add Spring Security to our application to make sure that it's secured? We'll go ahead and stop our application. And the first thing that we need to do is, as with anything, we need to update our dependencies. And here we're using Gradle. You can use whatever you like. Um, but you can see that we've added the Spring Security config and the Spring Security web jars. If you're using Maven, you could do something similar with that. But just know that those are the dependencies that we're using in this presentation. The next thing that you need to do is you need to create a new configuration class. So we'll go ahead and create our Spring Security config. And um, first, we need to get the folder here. And so the, the things that we need to do is the name of it's, it doesn't really matter, but we'll call it web security config. And then we need to extend the web security configure adapter. And then once we've done that, the only thing that we need to do with this is add, uh, override one of our methods. So we'll do that if I clip space. There we go. And we're just going to override the register authentication method. And what this is doing is, is instructing Spring Security how 
we can validate our users. And we're going to start off with something very simple. And we'll start off with an in-memory authentication, and then we'll just use a, a, just a user here, and then we'll give them the password password, nothing very secretive. And then roles, we'll use role user. And then we'll also add a second user. that has an admin role. So we only needed a single user, but we went ahead and did this so that we could, so that we were able to uh, have two different users. And then the next thing that we'll need to do is we need to, this is basically creating Spring Security's filter, and that filter needs to be registered with our application. So we'll go ahead and register it with our application here. And to do that, we'll create a security application initializer. And we'll want to extend the uh, abstract security web application initializer. And what this is doing is it's placing our Spring Security's filter, registering it with the, with the uh, container. So in this instance, Tomcat. And this, this is kind of the same thing that we used to have to do if we were working in our web XML. But uh, this is replacing the web XML. All right, and the other thing that we should point out is our configuration is getting registered using uh, our message uh, our message application initializer. And that's because basically we already had a Spring application, so it already had configuration in that. And it was registering with our root application context, here the root configuration, and that's doing component scanning within this package. So that means that our, our web security config is going to be picked up automatically because it's in the same package. If we did not already have a root application context, we could easily add one doing by adding a constructor here and then just passing in our our class into it. And that would create us a root application context with our security configuration. But since we're already registering it, we can't do this because it'll produce an error. All right, so now that we have those two configurations, we can actually go ahead and start, our, start up our app server again. Oh, and I, actually, I realized that uh, we, we missed something here. Um, don't forget to add the configuration annotation so that it gets picked up. And then we should also enable web security. Now that we've done that, should start up just fine. And we can see that we have our username and password. It's not a very pretty username and password login, but we didn't actually have to do anything to create this login form. It was generated for us by Spring Security. So if we type in an invalid username and password, we get an error message. And then if we type in a valid one, we're able to see the rest of our application. We can click around and do pretty much exactly what we were doing beforehand. One of the things that you'll notice that we're missing, though, is how do we display the username and the pass, uh, the username, and how do we log out? So let's update our application to include that. All right. So the, we'll update our template in main.jsp. And I've already prepared a snippet so that we don't have to see me type here. I'll just uncomment it out, and we'll, we'll go over that in just a second. So the first thing that we're doing is we're assigning a variable called authentication to the value of request user principal. Well, this is actually just our HTTP servlet request, and it's invoking a, the get principal method. So on here, there's a or get user principal. So that's returning a principal object. And then this object, the principal, 
as a get name. So there's a get name on there. So that, that's all this is doing is it's interacting with the standard HTTP servlet request and we're seeing if there's an uh, object on there. If it's non null, we'll go ahead and display that name that we looked at earlier and that'll be our username. And then we'll also create a logout form and that logout form should be a post. And the reason why you need to do a post for logout is to protect against cross-site request forgery attacks as we alluded to earlier. We'll go over in that in much more detail uh, a little later on, but just know now that by default you should be using a logout um, with a post with Spring Security. You can customize this if you want, but if you aren't using a post, you aren't protected against cross-site request forgery there. And then we also display the current user. And um, if we are not authenticated, we'll go ahead and display a sign-up URL. So let's see how that's impacted our UI. You can see here we are able to see the user, and if I log out, I can log back in as an admin. And that also updates my UI uh, to display admin, so I'm not pulling anything over on you guys. It's actually the current user. And I can log out as that user as well. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, I was able to get up and running very easily, but one of the things that's missing is our login screen doesn't match the rest of our application. So let's see how we can customize this to have our own login page. We'll come back to our web security configuration. And we will go ahead and configure it to have a custom authentication. And here you can see we're overriding a method in the superclass. So there's actually a default uh, implementation of this method that we can kind of borrow if we want to get started. You don't have to do it this way, but this will save us a bit of typing. And we want something quite similar to what's in the superclass. So here you can see our default configuration is simply going to be using uh, authorized requests. It says any request must be authenticated. And we also want form-based login. But the other thing that we need is we want to specify the login page. So what we can do is we can just type in login page. Should look quite familiar if you've used uh, the XML configuration. And now that we've specified the login page, Spring Security is going to back out of the way, and it's not going to render a login page for you. It's going to require you to render a URL, the URL slash login, as the login page. So how does that work? We have a MVC configuration already set up, so we've mapped the URL slash login to the view name login, which means all we need to do is create a login JSP. And our login JSP uses a form, and it posts to the login URL, which is what we configured previously. And it posts the username and password down here as the HTTP parameters username and password. Now, if we wanted, we could customize any of this, but these are all the defaults. If we submit it and it's an invalid username password, it'll redirect to the login page with the error query parameter. Otherwise, uh, it'll log in successfully. And when we log out successfully, it'll come back to this page with a logout query parameter on the same URL. And so that's how we're able to display the logout success. Now, if you want, again, you can customize any of these things, but we're just going to use the defaults because there's less configuration and we can move on to more important and more interesting things. All right, so we'll go ahead and start this up. And if anyone is familiar with the Java config, they might be saying, hey, it looks like you missed something. Let's see what we missed. We'll go ahead and request a page, and we get the web page has a redirect loop. We do this on purpose because uh, this is a very common error that people have. What's happening here? Well, we have authorized requests, and we're saying that any request requires me to be authenticated. If I'm not authenticated, I want to use form-based login and send you to the login page. Well, when you request the login page, Spring Security realizes you're not authenticated, so then it intercepts the request and then redirects you to the login page again. And this repeats over and over. So we need to be very explicit about security configuration in order to be secure. So we'll go ahead now and state that the login page is granted. And we can do this very easily with the Java configuration by using the permit all method. And again, you know, this is 
This is Spring Security's best guess that the login page is going to be granted to everyone. There's also a logout error page, as we saw, and that'll also be granted to everyone. So the permit all is basically any URLs impacting on form login with Spring Security's best guesses. Um, we don't want to guess incorrectly, so again, we need to do that, do that uh, explicitly. The only time that you'd probably run into an issue with this support is if you had a login URL that had you know, maybe a query parameter that said something like uh, requires authentication, and then you wanted that to require authentication. So Spring Security does its best guess, but uh, if your URLs aren't starting with log aren't login, then you're probably going to be OK. Um, uh, if your URLs that you want to protect are login, then uh, you're, you're going to have issues. But uh, if login is any URL that has login in it is not protected, then you're OK. All right, so the other thing that we need to do is we also need to grant access to our resources, because we have CSS and such. And we want to grant access to it. And the other thing that we want to do is we want to grant access to, we also want to grant access to our sign up page. So we'll grant access to the sign up page. But you know, you could do it this way if you want, but I actually prefer an even more concise way. And you can do with the Verargs. So it's it's much more concise. And you know that's that's pretty cool too. But we also we also want to update one more thing. We also want to configure our logout. So we want logout to be permit all too, so that if a user's already uh, you know they timed out and they click logout, everything works fine. And the we don't we also want to see the logout success message if we're not authenticated. So this permit all update logout. Now that we've done that, we should be able to start up our application and see our custom login page. So now you see that I have a custom login page. If I type in an invalid username and password, I get an error. If I type in a valid one, I authenticate just fine. And I also am able to log out and see a logout success. And I can also click the sign up link and see the sign up page. So everything, everything seems to be coming together now. I have my custom login page. I am able to, uh, I'm able to see, their, uh, see the user's username and log out. And um, everything seems fine, fine to me. But the thing that we need to do the thing that we still need to do is that uh, we need to uh, restrict access to the database slightly differently. So let's go ahead and update that so that we only want admin users to access our database. So let's, let's do that. We can say h2 is a URL. Anything that starts with h2 should have, have the role admin. And uh, you'll notice that uh, we don't have to say role underscore because it's going to be done automatically for us by the Java config support. OK, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. We'll go ahead and navigate to our database, and we'll click on that, and then we'll try to connect. And we get this strange error, invalid CSRF token. What's, what's happening there? That seems a little bit weird. What is happening? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at things uh, in a little more depth. What's happening is Spring Security is protecting us against a, a type of attack called cross-site request forgery. In order to understand it a little better, Let's 
disable a few things and dig in and see <coughs> excuse me, what cross-site request forgery is. And uh, we'll also take a look at clickjacking attacks. So we're going to disable a couple things in Spring Security so that we can actually use the attacks in a live demo. So we'll start off. We'll start off by going to our application, and we'll authenticate as a user, and we'll go ahead and open up. I've included these in the projects, and uh, so you can you can try this too if you want. We have two different. Uh, we have two different attacks here. The first one is cross-site request forgery. We have this big button saying, win money. Well, everyone loves winning money, so I'm sure they're going to click on this button, right? Let's see what the HTML source of this is. So if I click on the source, you can see that there's a uh, form object, and it's submitting to an action that's at localhost colon 8080 sample 100. And it has a hidden method called underscore method or a hidden input underscore method value delete. Well, that looks a lot like it's going to delete something off my application. And in fact, if we bring up our, our uh, developer tools here and I click Submit, you'll see that, in fact, it sends my J session ID over in the request. See, there's the J session ID. Uh, it sends my J session ID in the request, so it looks exactly like the request came from my application, and it deletes. Even though this is from a different, um, even though this is from a different domain, right now it's localhost. But you could imagine that this was being hosted on evil.com. It worked just the same. Just to prove that it got deleted, I can go to my inbox over here, and it's it's the exact same. You know, it, it happens to be the same thing. The other thing that I should point out is that we could use JavaScript to automatically submit the form, and it could be hidden in a hidden iframe. Uh, you know, the so we might not even know that this attack happened to us. So that's cross-site request forgery. There's a number of different variations of it, but that's one uh, one way to do it. The next one looks very similar. Our UI is. Uh, very exciting again, and uh, we want to win money. Everyone loves winning money, so again, I think they're going to go ahead and click it. But let's take a look at our, our code this time. Here you see we have a form, and this time it's submitting to pound, so it's not going to do anything when, if we click on that form. But we also have an iframe, and the iframe's content is sample, <coughs> the sample page. Excuse me. And you can see that I have some CSS here. Let's take a look at this page again with slightly different CSS. All right, so now if I refresh the page, you can see that I have a border, that black border, around the iframe, and then I see a delete button. What exactly is that delete button? we go back here, it's actually this delete button. To point that out, let's go ahead, just to kind of make this more obvious, let's create another message. And you can see that I created the message, and now I have two delete buttons here. If I refresh my uh, demo here, I get two delete buttons. So these buttons correspond to what's on my other page. So let's make it semi-transparent and see, you know, just to kind of point this out very explicitly, what's, what's happening here. So if it's semi-transparent, you can see that my win money button is there, and the delete button in the iframe itself is on top of that win money button. So if I go back to here and make it so that you uh, can't see it anymore, and I click on the win money button, it looks like nothing's happened. But in fact, what it does is it deletes one of my entries, because I actually clicked on that delete button that we were you know, displaying there. 
So that's a clickjacking attack. And it's important to point out that these are different, because one of them is happening within the iframe, which is on the correct domain. And the other one's happening from a totally different domain. So we need to protect against these differently. How do we protect against them with Spring Security? Well, the good news is if you're using Spring Security Java config, as we, we have been, um, we don't need to do anything other than, in our instance, remove, our, uh, remove the disabling of the protection. So it's, it's pretty simple for us to do. Just go ahead and delete these two lines. And let's go ahead and look at this one more time, but this time with it enabled and see how Spring Security is protecting us against these types of attacks. We'll start off by viewing our application. And you can see that I have uh, the two messages back. My in-memory database repopulated them because it gets repopulated on every, um, it gets repopulated every time that I restart the application. And here we have the exact same page. And this time when I click it, I get that strange error message we saw in our H2 admin console. And what's happening here? Well, if we look at our page source here, the real delete method actually has a hidden uh, input now called underscore CSRF with a secure random generated value. And that's the cross-site request forgery token. So now, whenever I create a request, I'm also expecting the token to be in the request. And what, when do I want that re uh, token to be in the request? It's any time I do an HTTP method, like post or put, that changes the state of my application. So the steps that you need to take in order to protect yourself is not only enable Spring Security, but you also need to ensure that anywhere in your application you're using the proper methods. And you might think to myself, well, I got a great idea. I'll include the token in URLs too, and I'll be much more secure. I'll put it in gets as well. But the issue with putting it in a, in a get is that it can be leaked. Even though the query string gets encrypted, it can be leaked in things like browser history or refer URLs. There's plenty of places where that information can uh, be leaked out to the user. So if you're doing any sort of private information, it should be in a post. OK, so that, that's pretty cool. Let's make sure that this actually works. If I click it on it, it's deleted. That's, that's really cool. But why didn't I have to update my application in order to include that? If we look at our inbox, we have, uh, we have a form. And that form is using Spring MVC's form tag. And it basically, if you're using Spring MVC's form tag, it, Spring Security automatically integrates with this. And it allows you to, um, it basically automatically includes the cross-site request forgery protection uh, parameter. So you don't actually even need to do anything if you're using Spring MVC. The other thing that we should point out is that's why we're doing a logout with a post, because the logout needs to be some, we don't want someone from another site to force our users to log out. And in fact, we also want to do that on our login page, um, because we don't want our users to end up being logged in by a malicious user and then having that malicious user trick the user into entering information into a account that they own. So, you know, you might have a, a web application that keeps your secrets in it, and the malicious user might automatically log you in using cross-site request forgery as evildoer. And then when you enter in your secret information, it's an evildoer's web uh, account. You might not realize it. And then evildoer will actually look at your secrets. So you also want to protect against cross-site request forgery on login. Now, if you don't have the tag library because you aren't using JSPs or for whatever reason, there's, there's basically just an attribute on the HTTP servlet request that allows you to access the token directly. And um, there's also an attribute that allows you to do, figure out what the parameter name is 
because that can, you know, you can configure these things if you want them to change. And then there's also a header name. And you can see here that it's actually all running together because of the styling, but there, the first part is the token, and then underscore CSRF is the, the, the name of the parameter, and then X dash CSRF dash token is the header name. And you might want the header name if you're doing something like JSON. You know, uh, you can't include a parameter in the body of a JSON request because it's, it's the wrong content type. So in that instance, you can also include Spring Security in your, or the token in your AJAX request. And there's some doc on the website that demonstrates how you can automatically include that in your, all your um, jQuery requests. Or if you're, using, um, if you're using curl, you could also do it there. So there's, a, there's basically there's some ways that you can do this very readily if you aren't using JSPs also. So we don't need that anymore. All right, now um, we've talked quite a bit about cross-site request forgery, but we still, we still have this other type of attack. Remember, we said the iframe is actually the iframe is actually uh, on the correct domain, so it's going to include the token for us as well. So how are we going to protect against that? I'll go ahead and click on this a couple of times, and you might not believe me that I'm clicking on it, but if you don't, you can go ahead and check out the project and try it yourself. And you can see that it didn't get deleted. So let's see why it's not getting deleted. The first clue that we might see is that if we update our click jacking so that we can see it again. We only see the border. We actually don't see a delete button anymore. That seems kind of strange. We, we saw that working earlier. What, what's happening now? Our developer tools gives us another clue. It says it can't be displayed forbidden by X-frame options. OK, well, it looks like we're getting somewhere now. If we go to this page, and we look at our network tab, and we refresh our page. We see that there's a header called uh, X frames deny, X frame options deny. And basically, what that's doing is for browsers that support it, it's denying this from being framed. And you can make it so that it's the same origin, so you can only allow it to be framed by your origin. There's, there's plenty of other options. But right now, it can't be framed. And so since it can't be framed, Chrome and other compatible browsers will refuse to render that content, and there's no delete button to click on. And so you are now protected against clickjacking attacks. Older browsers, there's ways to do that with like JavaScript bust out of frames. But uh, if you read a lot about it, you'll, you'll find that most of those techniques are pretty brittle. So it, it makes it pretty difficult. You can also see that Spring Security is in injecting our cache control headers. You can also see that uh, it, it's injecting uh, the X content type options to prevent content sniffing. And uh, we also block on cross-site scripting protection built into browsers. There's a number of different headers that Spring Security is injecting that you can read about more later on. Uh, just go on to the Spring Security documentation. OK, so that's pretty cool. We're able, to, we're able to do all this stuff now. But you know, that means that H2, uh, I guess I'm not, uh, I'm not actually authenticated as, um, I'm not authenticated as our user at the moment. So well, uh, but I, can't act, I still can't access our, our database because the database doesn't know about Spring Security's protections. And so what can we do to resolve this? Because we still want to access our database. All right, so what we can do is we can create a separate configuration for our H2 admin. The first thing we can do is we can delete this. Then we can add another class called h2 admin uh, config extends 
security configure adapter. Should look very familiar. It's pretty much the exact same thing we've done so far. We'll override this method. And we will configure HTTP security there. The other thing we want to do is we want to add an order annotation. We'll go over that in just a minute, but I just want to make sure that we don't forget it. And here we'll just basically say ant matcher. And we'll say that if it starts with H2, then we're going to process that request. So this is a little different than the ant matchers we've seen thus far in that it's determining which configuration we're going to use. Are we using this config? or that config. So the ant matcher here is actually what states which one. And we know that because we haven't said authorize requests yet. So now we can say authorize requests. Since all of these requests will start with h2, we can just say any request as role admin. And now uh, any of our stuff is going to come into this configuration, and we're authorizing as admin. So we can just go ahead and disable cross-site request order here. And we'll also disable the headers here. And so you might say, well, doesn't that mean that the H2 admin console is vulnerable to these types of attack? Yes, it does. But there's not much we can do about it. So we're just going to demonstrate how you could disable it. And uh, hopefully, that could, you know, we could update our UI eventually. But it also shows you how you can have separate configurations. You know, it's very similar to having multiple HTTP elements in your XML configuration. OK, so we'll go ahead and start up our application server. And this time, we can authenticate as our admin user. And we should be able to see our console just fine. So that's pretty cool we're, that we're able to, able to run this uh, separately from the rest of our app. We're still able to protect the rest of our app. We don't have time to prove that. Well, I guess we do. We can, uh, we can prove that that's still working. We can, um, we can show that just real quick. File. We can click on that and see we're still protected against cross-site request forgery on the rest of our application. So that's pretty cool. Um, but again, you know, our, our admin, our, our database is still uh, vulnerable to those types of attacks as well. Okay, so now that we've now that we've done that, we we can. Um, we can also look at our sign-up page. Let's take a look at that. We have this sign-up page. And if I authenticate as this user, we can add this user. <clears throat> and then when I do, I'm autom automatically authenticated as that user. So that's pretty cool. You know, I don't. I don't have to type in a username and password afterwards. Let's see how we're implementing that in Spring Security. We have a sign up controller. And here we have at the very top, at the top of it, we have of this method, we just have some basic Spring MVC stuff. We're using the user repository, which is just Spring Data to save our stuff. Spring Data is pretty awesome. Go ahead and use it if you're not. If, uh, you already are using it. Use it more. All right, good plug for that. Uh, now, once, once we've done that logic, though, we need to authenticate the user. And what we're doing here is we're just hard coding role user. So we're saying anyone that authenticate or creates an account will be a user. Then we have this user details object. The user details is just Spring's representation of a user. Um, we could use a custom one, and in fact, we will a little later on. But uh, right now, we're going to use Spring Security's built-in uh, user object. And then this authentication object is just, it basically encompasses the user and also includes information like which roles they have. And then we set it on the security context holder. Well, what's the security context holder? This is 
how Spring security determines what our current user is. It doesn't matter how the security context holder gets populated. As long as it's populated, that's what it treats the current user as. And in fact, if you look at this, we have this get context method and then this get authentication method. This authentication method is actually the exact same thing we saw in our JSP earlier. So, but it was mapped by our HTTP servlet request. So when we're invoking user principal, that is our authentication object. So that's where that's coming from. Very cool, huh? All right, so now, now we're able to do that. And we're able to see. But if I log out, one of the issues I have is if I log out, and then I try to log back in as that user, I'm not logging in. And the reason for that is, as we said earlier, right now we're using Spring Securities in memory configuration. We aren't using our Spring Data or our user model object, so this isn't getting updated. We could, there is a, um, there is a way to update this, so we could actually, you know, use use Spring Securities APIs to update the users in here. But why would we want to keep track of our users twice? So one approach to dealing with that would be to create our own custom user detail service. And we'll go ahead. We need to make sure that we create that user detail service. So we'll do a component scan. And then the base classes is our created uh, this class beforehand so we don't have to do any typing. And it's just user details. All right, so now we have a user detail service. And apparently, I left that running. So now we have a, uh, our own user detail service. And what does that look like? Let's see, let's see what this looks like to implement. So if you, the easiest way, if you're doing something that has a username and you're authenticating ba based upon username and password, is to create a user detail service. And the contract for that is to return a user detail. So first, we use our user repository to get our own user object. And if it's null, we throw a username not found exception. Otherwise, we return a user repository user details. Huh? What's that? Well, it's, um, it's kind of verbose. But what it is is extending our user, our existing user that we have in ours, and implements user details. So Spring Security can refer to it as a user details. And we can refer to it as a user object. And we just hard code a few things because we don't really have an idea of authority. So we just say role user for all our authorities. And then we also map our username to be the email address. And then we, again, we hard code a few things down here because we don't have a notion of expired accounts in our application. We don't care about that. But Spring Security does some checks and allows us to do that. So we return that for the interface. Once that happens, we're able to return the user repository user details. And Spring Security will use that for our current user. So that's, that's pretty nice. We're now, we're now able to see how to do that with uh, Spring Security and use our custom user. But now how do we leverage that? Well, earlier we said that, that uh, this is just mapping to that authentication object. And our user details. Uh, is basically going to be the principal on it. So now my current user is the principal. And that means that that's going to be our custom user object. And so what I can do is I can access the properties on that custom user object. So here you can see that uh, I'm accessing those attributes. And those are just, again, those are just on our 
uh, user object, it has a first and last name. So that's where that's coming from. OK, so now that I've done that, I can go ahead and start up my application server. And I can access my page. And I can't log in as the admin user anymore because it, we aren't using that. It's not in memory. But I can log in as Rob. And now Rob Winch is displayed. I actually did the wrong order for the username password, but that, that doesn't really matter. You can easily update that. And um, I'm still able to log out, no problem as well. And if I sign up, though, I sign up for a new account, what's going to happen? I get this error. And the error is basically stating that the property is not found. And that I'm basically looking for a first and last name. And the reason why it's not found is because our sign up controller is populating it with Spring Security's user details. So this is not our user object. It's Spring Security's object. So it has no first and last name on it. We can't access it. So what we can do, though, is we can delete that. And we don't need to use the user details. We can just use our own user object that we created. So now that we've done that, there's no need to actually have that user details object from Spring Security. Now, once we've done that, we'll go ahead and start it up. And this time, when we sign up, uh, we actually still have the J session. The J session ID got um, it actually got uh, uh, the J session ID got restored. So it's actually using the same improperly formatted object. So that's basically what's happening there. And um, all right, now that we've cleared out our cookies, we can show you that uh, actually we already have a Rob user. We need to do first, last. And now you can see that I can see first and last. And then I can also log in with first. So that's pretty cool. Now I'm able to use my custom users, and I'm able to display custom attributes on the page without any problems. But one of the things that we'll notice is if I log in as any of my users right now, I'm displaying messages for Luke and Rob, and this is first and last. So why is, why is first last seeing Rob's and Luke's messages? Well, the reason is because we aren't querying based upon the current user. So how can we access that current user? Let's update our message controller to use the current user. So right now, we have a list method. And we have our user object. We'd like to be able to access that. So we could do, we could add that as an argument. And then there's actually a hook in Spring MVC and Spring Security that allows us to access the authentication principle. So that's what we've been talking about the whole time. You know, our security context holder is uh, has a security context which has an authentication, and then that authentication has a principle method, and that's what this would return, which would be our current user. But we can also further abstract that out. We can just say current user instead, and this allows us to be very uh, isolated in where we're coupled to Spring Security. Because we have this current user annotation, and then it has the authentication principle as a meta annotation. So, so that's the only place that we're depending on Spring Security. You also want to make sure that it's for the correct targets for that to work. And now, when, when I resolve the user object, it's going to be the current user. And you might say, well, why do I need the current user annotation? Why can't I just detect that by type? Well, the reason is, is because you don't you want to be able to easily distinguish between the, the current user and maybe a user that you're creating in a sign-up form. 
you don't want to confuse the two because maybe a user is editing a user or um, something like that. So you, you want to make sure that you get that correct. All right, now that we've done that, we actually have a method here prepared that we can find all the messages by the two ID. So the two, two is just an object on the message, which is who the message is to, which is a user. And then that user has an ID. So basically what we're doing is we're finding all the messages for this user. All right, now we're able to do that. We'll go ahead and check out that in action. So we'll log in as Rob again. And now I only see Rob's messages. But what I could do is I could actually update the URL, and now I can see Luke's messages too. So I'm, hello, Luke, and it's Rob that's seeing it. So what's, what's wrong with that picture? Well, Rob shouldn't see Luke's messages. So how can we, how can we fix that? How, how can we address that situation? Let's take a look and see how we can deal with that. All right, then in order to address this, we need to enable global method security. And we also want to enable pre-post annotations. And we'll go over this, what this means in just a second. The other thing is, is global method security needs some sort of authentication if it needs to authenticate the user. And right now, the authentication is public or is protected, so it's limited to the scope of our, our web configuration. So what we can do instead is we can auto-wire the global instance of the Authentication Manager Builder, which that basically means that both Spring Security's global method security and the web security will see the same method for authenticating users. Go ahead and kick this off. Oh, we have to add the annotation to our service, too. Sorry about that. All right, so we have the message repository. And we also need to secure the method. So the way that we do that is this is the method that's being used. And we can use a post authorize annotation. And the post authorize annotation allows us to easily refer to method arguments and return values. So what we can do here is we can just say the return object, which is going to actually refer to the message being returned. It's just a keyword. And we'll put the question mark in there to make sure we don't get null pointer exceptions if it's null value. Two, uh, so that's the two property on the message object, ID equals, and we keep saying that our current principal is a user object, our user object, and that has an ID on it. The reason why this is going to work is because we've customized uh, Spring Security's notion of what our user details is. If we didn't do that, this principle wouldn't be the right type, and we couldn't access the identifier on it. So now that we've done that, Spring Security, will, if this expression returns true, it'll allow it to happen. Otherwise, it'll throw a security exception, and you'll get access denied. So let's give that a shot. We'll go ahead and go to our inbox. And you can see that it's listing just fine. And now if I try to manipulate the URL, I get access denied. So that's pretty, that's pretty neat. Uh, very easily able to protect that method. And then if I log in as Luke, Luke can see his method message, but if he tries to view Rob's message, you get an access denied. 
So it seems to be working. But it could still be improved upon. So let's see how we can make this a little bit better. One of the issues that we see here is that if we were doing this frequently, we'd have a lot of, a lot of repetition. So how can we externalize this? We can do a has permission, and then we can say return object read. So do we have read permissions for that object? Well, that's not all we need to do. We need to actually do a little bit more. Let's see how we can update our config for that to work. So the first thing that we'll need to do is we need to configure our security uh, slightly differently. We need to create another, we'll customize this by by overriding this method, or overriding some methods in the configuration. So we'll call it method security config that extends global method security configuration now that i've uh, extended that i can override one of my methods and i'll just override this uh, expression handler and now I can say that I want to use a default method security expression handler. So we're creating, this is very similar to what the superclass is doing, but we're also going to set the permission evaluator. And then we'll return the handler. And that permission event. Uh, evaluator sorry about that is going to just be auto wired in so we'll just auto wire that private having trouble typing apparently permission evaluator and where's that coming from well we actually already created a permission evaluator ahead of time. And that's, that's happening based upon this. So has permission is accepting our authentication, which is the current authentication. Spring Security will populate that for us. And then this target domain object is the same thing we specified it in our, um, in our annotation. So you can see here has permission return object. So that's going to be a message object. And then the second one's going to be read, which is just the read permission. We aren't going to really implement this very complicated. We're going to just do the exact same logic that we had earlier. But you can imagine where you might do something where admin users could uh, read and write, and other users could only um, update their own messages or something like that. All right, so now we have the current user. We are able to access it, and we basically do the exact same logic, current user.getID. Is it equal to the message.get2.getID? So this is the same logic we had in our annotation, but it's centralized. So if we needed to change it, we'd very easily be able to do so. So let's go ahead and start that up and see that it works still. We'll log in as our user. Oh. And Rob can see his message. And he can't see Luke's. And we'll go ahead and skip validating the opposite. We've already demonstrated that with the simple approach. But you can try that on your own if you, if you want. 
And then, um, so now, now we're able to make sure that everything's authorized and things are nice and secure. But, you know, how do we test all this stuff? How do we test spring security? Let's take a look and see how we can do that with Spring Test MVC. Spring Test MVC, you basically use the Spring J unit runner, and then we specify the configs that we want to load. And then we also specify this web app configuration so that it knows that it's a web application. And that allows us to auto wire a web application context. And our security configuration allows us to get the Spring Security filter chain. And these are just a couple of mock objects that we're going to be using. Um, here, the mock MVC builders, we, we basically create mock MVC. And the trick here is you just add the filters. So now Spring Security is one of the filters on that. And then we build it. And then right here, you can see that we have uh, the inbox requires, authentic, requires login. So how are we doing that? We basically say perform a get. And then we expect a login. And this is just a way that I've extracted out our logic so that it's a little more reusable if we wanted. Uh. And all we're doing to make sure that it goes to login pages, see if it redirects to the right location. And then what we want to do also is we want to see if the inbox shows Rob's messages. So what we do is we request the inbox and then we use the with keyword. The with is allows us to do a request post pop processor. And this is uh, something is not implemented in Spring Security yet, but uh, you can easily copy this example. It, it should work just fine for you. The, the thing is, is the Spring Security's post processors probably need a little bit of polish before we could release them to the public in terms of what we want to name methods and stuff like that. But this this will work just fine. It's just a class, and all it does is it actually populates the HTTP session with the correct user on our mock HTTP session. And so now Spring's, Spring Security will think that Rob is authenticated as a real user. And when we perform that request, we see that the messages that are displayed are only for Rob. This is, this is Rob's identifier. So that's pretty cool. Um, we also can try typing an invalid username and password, just doing a post to login, and then including the parameter username and password. And here you'll notice that we need a different type of width. We want to include the cross-site request forgery token, because otherwise we'll get an error. And uh, again, invalid login, we just validate that it's sending us to the correct page. And here we test with a valid username and password. And we make sure that we go to the index page. And then we can also check to see if things require cross-site request forgery. So we can populate it with an invalid cross-site request forgery token, or not, not provide a cross-site request forgery token. And then we can validate that we get it in error. And we're just basically checking to see that we get a forbidden. And you know, again, you can update those as you see fit. This is just something that I put at the bottom of the page, and you can you can reuse that if you want as well. And then we also check, this is our method level security that we're testing here. We don't want to, we want to make sure Luke uh, or Rob can't access Luke's messages. So we check to see if it's forbidden. And then we also check to see if Rob can access his own messages because we want to make sure we aren't restricting access to everything. So this should give you a fairly good idea of how to do things. Again, these classes, you know, this isn't built into security. You'd have to copy paste this into your class. There's nothing wrong with it. Again, it's just we need to finalize on some of the method names and stuff like that. And we just wanted to get Java config and cross site request forgery and all the other exciting new features out as soon as possible. So there's a pretty easy workaround for this. And uh, we just thought it was more important to get on with the release. And, um, and so what we can do now is we'll go ahead and just run these tests real quick. And you can see that, uh, that everything just works. So uh, again, if you want to check out the presentation, you can see that we have, uh, we have a URL. So if you want the sample code, go out to GitHub and get it. Uh, you, if you want to learn more about Spring Security, check out Spring Security website. 
You can reach me um, on Twitter. And um, you know, if you're u talking about Spring Security, use hashtag Spring Security. And uh, there'll be more videos posted on springio. slash video. So uh, check those out if there were any sessions that you missed and wanted to check out. Thanks for attending, and I, I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations.